Okay, let's give it a couple of seconds. Let people join the room. I can see people are joining now. So give it a couple more seconds. Okay, wonderful. Let's get going. Um, welcome to China's China Institute's Pieces of China, which is an online series that tells the story of China one object at a time. I'm Dinda Elliott. I'm the Director of Programs, uh, and I'm honored to be joined today by Peggy Wong, who is an art historian at Bowdoin College, and she's also the author of a new book that just came out last week with the intriguing title, The Future History of Contemporary Chinese Art. Um, Peggy is going to talk about the, the, a work called The Great Criticism Series by the superstar contemporary artist Wang Guangyi. Um, welcome, Peggy. Great to have you. Thank you so much, Dinda. It's great to be here. Great to have you. Um, but before we jump into Wang Guangyi's um, work, tell us a little bit about the idea behind this book, The Future History of Contemporary Chinese Art. Um, what are you trying to kind of rectify? Or what do you, what's the point you're trying to make with this book? Yeah, so, right, the future history of contemporary Chinese art, here yep, it is. Thank you for that. I don't have my copy yet, so that's great. <laughs> yep. Uh, it does have a provocative title, and I use the term future history for a couple of reasons. One is that I'm really cognizant of how we interpret artworks, and how artworks in the past, and the artworks that I look at particularly uh, from the late 80s and early 90s and say, if we continue to evaluate and interpret according to specific ways of thinking, particularly modes that we might think of with contemporary Chinese art, how will future histories be written? How will generations, future generations of art historians, but also artists be treated, right? So if we use only very limited frames of interpretation, that's gonna create, continue to kind of perpetuate these very, very narrow views going forward. So it's really a call to kind of reassess our current modes of interpretation, contextualization, how we even think about China and Chinese artists in the world. Um, and my hope is that by broadening that, by asking, you know, maybe less asked questions of very well-known artists like Wang Guangyi, we can think, oh, wow, I had never thought of his work in that way. And then secondly, why haven't we asked these questions before, right? So it's kind of a shining a light back onto art history as a discipline. Um, but also really speaking to how people think about contemporary Chinese art at large. Fantastic. So um, tell, tell us a little bit about what you noticed about the books that your students typically were reading, the art history books and the limitations of those books. Yeah, so I do have to say that the ideas for this book and like the directions for it as I was forming it was very much informed by my students. Uh, and you know, the materials that I would come across when I was teaching. And so we teach at intro level all the way up to seminar level. And the introductory level books, for example, I have one right here. This is one that we use, it's called Art History. Uh, and it would have one chapter on say, 16th century Italian art. And then it would have another chapter that was just China and Korea after 1355. And when students see this, they see this incredible imbalance in wow. treatment, right? One chapter is giving great nuance and, you know, just saying, oh, this is very significant. The other one is saying China, Korea, it's okay, they can go together. It's okay if we miss, you know, entire swaths of time periods. Um, and one thing I also think is that, you know, like modern China, 20th century China gets one paragraph. Wow. I think, is it because maybe we dismiss propaganda, right? Ways of thinking about art that fall outside of painting and sculpture and these also narrow ways in which we might define art. So what gets written into and out of art histories and then that gets, you know, basically legitimized and validated in these sorts of textbooks. And so I think we have to correct that imbalance, first of all, and then secondly say, then if there isn't this nuance or what are these questions that aren't being asked that will allow us to have an expanded view of art history, one that's more fair and inclusive, that is where I feel like my book or my scholarship, that's really where I position myself as a way of trying to rectify this imbalance. 
Yeah, it's incredible how Eurocentric our perspectives on art history have been here in the West. I mean, it's amazing to see that tome that you just showed us and, you know, that they treat China and Korea or whatever in one chapter. Um, so tell us a little bit about why you chose to talk about Wang Guangyi's Great Criticism series, uh, which I understand was created starting in 1990 and then finished in 1998. Um, it's a super famous series of images. Some say it's riffing off of Andy Warhol. Some say it's a form of political criticism. But, you know, what's important about it to you? And is there something that we misunderstand about it? Yeah, thanks. I will say it did start in 1990. It still kind of continues through the 2000s, though. Okay. Um, but it has this longevity. And like you said, it has this incredible fame. Like, it's so well known. Right? And that is one of the reasons I picked it is because it is so famous. Mm -hmm. and because it is wrapped up in the rise of contemporary Chinese art outside of the PRC and how the West receives it. So on the screen here, I'm just sharing a couple images. The one yeah. on the left shows Wang Guangyi in front of his works at the Venice Biennale, considered this total milestone in which contemporary Chinese art is being viewed, you know, uh, taking part in this major exhibition abroad. And you could also see the kind of the size and scale, they're very large. Uh, and even though there will be many different artists or kind of a range of artists in an exhibition, reviewers and critics and audiences really gravitate towards Wang Guangyi's work. And so much so that it would say, appear on magazine covers or in newspaper articles and reviews. And so we see the cover flash art pretty early on, 1992, that it's already there. And so we have to ask like, why was his series singled out? Um, and then because of those repercussions later on, it does very well in the market, right? And part of it is because it seemed to Western audiences to really fit into a narrative about China that they had at that time. And that narrative is about, if we go to the next slide, I think we can see too, um, this idea that he is riffing off of uh, Andy Warhol, right? So this echoes the reviews that we see of his work in the early 90s where people say, well, you know, it seems like Chinese artists are only just discovering pop. So uh, Western audiences, it'll look familiar because it's kind of like a deja vu, right? And this perpetuates a very harmful view where artists outside of the West are just always derivative, always catching up, very belated compared to a more progressive, original, advanced West, right? right. So, and, so as an old journalist, so yeah. I was based in Beijing back in, you know, 1990 and in the late 80s. And so I always see things in, the, in their sort of cultural and political context. So just to set the stage for a second here, you know, that was not long after the end of the Cultural Revolution. All this stuff, all these, you know, Western images were very new in China. Were totally new, right? And um, and it was, you know, 1990, just a year after the student movement uh, in Beijing and the, you know, crackdown on the student movement, Tiananmen. All that stuff is is kind of a cultural context that you, I think, it's valuable to look look at. It is very valuable. And actually this idea of how they were even thinking about Western art, you're right that in the 1980s, it was new, right? And artists were really absorbing it. And actually, if we look at earlier work by Wang Guangyi, he's very much thinking about that, but also thinking that he can participate and freely take from uh, Western art. And, and there were no repercussions. People wouldn't think that he was being derivative because it seemed like this really kind of moment of like civilizational enlightenment that had art could do these great things. But by the end of the 80s, they're thinking very, very differently about Western art and thinking, why have I, maybe we don't have something so shared. Maybe it actually, um, why have I actually looked to Western art so much and not privileged my own art, like my own art history? And that's actually where great criticism comes in and at this incisive moment where he's thinking, hmm, what kind of art do I wanna do? What kind of art history do I, do I want to turn to? And so great criticism is this time in which he's not just setting up these like symbols of capitalism, capitalism and socialism and putting them in ideological antagonism. That happens, that kind of reading is also very popular when we only think of artists as political dissidents. And that is a very common trope, right? These artists must be critiquing China or at least poking fun at China. Like that is 
a common reading here. Um, and it also comes out when we uh, only look at the works in terms of symbols, right? So it must be this clash of symbols together. But once we start to think, hmm, what is he doing visually, right? What is he thinking in terms of the art historical resources and sources that he's turned to? We have a broader picture. And so we go to the next image too. I'm just showing you some like more examples of these works and we see, huh, he's actually strategically thought about these works. He's had different, he's making them compositionally, very coherent. Maybe it's not so much about a clash, but maybe something shared. There's like these other ways in which we might think of it. It's more ambiguous mm -hmm. than we might think, at mm -hmm. least at the political, if you're reading it just in terms of political life. But mm -hmm. I think that more has to be done in terms of interrogating it as what he's thinking as an artist, right? And so if we go to the next image. I love this. That, okay, explain what this is. Yeah, so what he was doing is that he wasn't just pulling from any propaganda and saying, in the 1990s, it's totally anachronistic to have workers, peasants, soldiers, because he himself was thinking, what kind of art history, what kind of art am I turning, what kind of visual pieces? He turned to not just any propaganda materials, but these things called Baoto uh, booklets. And I have a couple examples here. You can see they're very small. And wow. what they are, are they're just full of these, almost like clip art like images. And if we go to the next image too, you can see that they even have borders and different fonts. Uh, and the next image, we can see that with these, they even have little didactic at the end that show you, you know, maybe how, like principles of anatomy. Um, and on the left, there's kind of a design layout because what they would be used for is people in villages and towns would make billboards, they would make newspapers that they would hang up or blackboards that they would illustrate from. And they could freely choose, you know, any of these images and say, okay, I'm gonna have a horizontal layout or a vertical layout and put this here and put that there. And this idea of these like, half trained, just people, you know, freely participating in image production and making art for the people, by the people, right? He thought, thinks this is really valuable. Why haven't I seen this in contemporary art before? Like, why haven't I myself turned to that? Mm -hmm. So he's actually rectifying an entire visual tradition that he recognizes has a whole process, has its own values. Even the image on the right talking about figure types, I mean, if you read it, it talks about how, you know, workers have very muscular bodies, but landlords, if you're going to illustrate them, they have flabby bodies because they exploit workers. Wow. So this idea of that there's an entire value system behind it is something that he wants to turn to. So for the next image. And those can have been from the, from the 60s, basically, or from, you know, uh, certainly the cultural. Yeah, from the early 70s, yeah. primarily, but we actually, I mean, they continue actually to the 80s. Yeah. We still have other yeah. images because this idea of informing the people um, is still really important. Mm -hmm. So Wang Guang is turned to this as a way of saying, hey, now I'm gonna picture that in my canvas. I'm using my canvas as a platform for validating legitimizing, making this entire visual tradition available and saying, this is an important art history too. And maybe mm -hmm. art by making that visible is a form of constituting and showing other people that this is also really important now. So mm -hmm. it, it actually completely pushes against this idea that he was riffing, uh, just riffing off Andy Warhol, yeah. but saying, yes. no, actually he's reaching deep into uh, an existing visual tradition that comes from his own childhood and that he didn't see as valuable before, but now is turning saying, we need to make ourselves visible. Like I need to see myself in art. Yeah, so I think it's so cool. interesting because it, you know, um, there was a book written recently about is essentially Chinese history is looking at what do Chinese people learn when they're growing up? Mm -hmm. And that's what you're saying is you kind of have to understand this artist you have to look at where he came from and what references, cultural references he is bringing into his work, mm -hmm. which we in the West may know nothing about. Right, and then if you also have books like this that only give a paragraph to her, <laughs> you're definitely not gonna learn about that. Right. And then, so you don't know what the references are in contemporary art. 
Yeah. So we're just about up to time, but I'm really curious as to like, let's get back to Wang Guangyi, because one of the beauties of your book is, which everybody should buy, by the way, The Future History of Contemporary Chinese Art. Um, but um, you interviewed at great length, you know, all of the artists who are in your book. And so I'm really curious, like, you know, do the artists care about this stuff? What would what would Wang Guangyi have to say about sort of the way, you know, Western audiences interpret his work or whatever? Yeah, I do think that he he tends to kind of have a bit of a hands off approach that people can have different interpretations. I can't control that. Um, he will say, I'm not trying to critique China, though. I feel like that is a stance that he would take. Like, I'm not actually not criticizing this country, but he would. I think what happens in these interviews is really interesting when you start asking about process, you start asking them how they made the work and not just, OK, so you're pitting this symbol against this symbol. They, they, they perk up because they are artists, right? They are creators. They are making these decisions and they see that you are asking them about their deep ideas about art. And they want to be treated as artists and not just, you know, tokens or knee-jerk political dissidents and say, yeah, I am, I have thought deeply about it. It is part of my trajectory in thinking about art, art history, my own interventions in place within it. So fantastic. Wow. Well, and we're right on the on the dot. It's a quarter after. So unfortunately, our time is up. But I want to thank Peggy Wong so much for giving us this bite sized take on um, a contemporary Chinese art. And we hope very much to try to bring her back, hopefully in person next time. Um, and thank you all to the audience for tuning in. Uh, we want to really encourage you to become members of China Institute because your membership allows us to helps us to bring brilliant speakers to you like Peggy Wong. And uh, I, I also want to say we're, we're going to take a little break for Chinese New Year from Pieces of China, but we're, we're going to have a fascinating music chat next week about music played at Chinese New Year. And we have a Chinese New Year family festival on, on Saturday, February 13th. So please tune into that. Uh, finally, I will say our next Pieces of China on February 25th, just, just to show the diversity of the, the um, brilliant speakers we're bringing, it's gonna feature the American journalist and author, Jim Fallows, who's gonna talk about aviation in China and the harrowing flight that he co-piloted from Changsha to Guang to Zhuhai when he was living in China. So um, please come back for that. And Peggy, I wanna thank you again so much for helping us tell the story of China. Thank you so much, Dinda. And we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you, Peggy. <laughs>